<laughs> I see that it looks like yeah, I, had a, right. I had an unexpected road trip today. Michael, are you driving? Yeah, I, I had an unexpected road trip I had uh, to make. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Uh, let me get my, I, I, my computer crashed like 15, 14 minutes ago. So I had to regroup and get on Kim's computer. Um, and I think, I'm hoping I can get my little thing up here I was wanting to use. Uh, well, everybody got small. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Help, help, help. I'm still working on trying to make everything work here. Um, There's your eagles in the backyard. The wives, I was just starting off with that. I had double eagles. So it was on Thursday morning. Um, yeah, I, I can't get it full screen. That's what my problem is here. All right, let's see. I, I, I had to regroup, so I've got to get myself together here. Um, thing we didn't do last meeting was we didn't start off with prayer. We didn't pray at the end either, so I want to make sure we do that first. So, so I'm going to do that now, okay? Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I've got that. There we are. All right, so that's it's on the top of my list here. Um, it says pray first. I don't, you probably can't see that. Father God, we thank you that you've given us another week to bring others into your kingdom. And uh, we ask you that we you open our minds and our hearts this morning to share our feelings and learn about your, uh, your word to us and how it affects us and how it leads us. And we ask you to make us strong witnesses for your word to those around us in Jesus' name. All right. Uh, let me see. I still don't Amen. have this the way I like it, but um, Kim Kim needs to clean her computer up. I I ran a I don't know, I hope this is not why it crashed, but before I started using that computer again, I ran a cleanup thing on it and made it a whole lot faster. But it crashed this morning. I can't get it to come back up. Um, what I'm showing here is a timeline. I know that's kind of blurry because it was real small and I enlarged it a whole lot, but I just wanted to kind of give you a timeline of where we've been so far. Uh, this starts with Adam, uh, goes back, uh, cutting that as year zero and up to 2400, uh, at 2400 years after that, years since creation, we get to Joseph, which we finished uh, Genesis up I guess last uh, last Saturday, I believe it looks like. Um, and and Nick had asked a question if y'all saw that on the text message about whether or not we're going to talk about today's reading. And I no, I don't want to do it that way. Uh, the the if you any of you ever looked at that discussion list they sent that I forwarded to you back before we got started, they have seven days worth of discussions each time, and they start on. Uh, I think it starts on Saturday with the one through seven or maybe no, it starts on starts on Friday because the first of the year started on Friday. And uh, when we do the Thursday night meeting, the one time we did the Thursday night meeting, that kind of fit OK. But on Saturdays, what I've been kind of doing was starting with uh, the second one on the list, which would have been the previous Saturday and then going up until Friday, which would be yesterday. So with that in mind, uh, we're gonna start with Genesis. Well, we'll, we'll do real quick about uh, last Friday's Genesis 46, but here's another timeline. Um, if you look at the time of Noah, this is just where everybody was. And this is in years BC. So Abraham was about 2000 BC, Isaac 1900 BC, Jacob 1840 BC, Joseph 1750 BC, and Moses around 1500. And these are approximate. Uh, Joshua, we haven't got to him yet, uh, going into the promised land around 1450 BC. Um, so there's the timeline of what we've been studying this past week. Um, now, I like to show these maps. Um, one of the reasons I like to show the maps, when we went to Israel, 
the, the geography really enhanced the way I understood the scripture. Um, just knowing where we were and putting all that together. And Nick, Nick may understand, anybody that's traveled, I guess, would understand how geography enhances what you understand. But the, most of what we've been talking about with Joseph uh, and, and Israel has been in this area. Goshen, that's the Nile Delta right there, and I've got a picture later of, you know, everybody you kind of envision Egypt and most of the Middle East being mostly desert, but if you look at a Google Earth view of this Nile Delta, it's all green and I guess not necessarily because it rains a lot, it's because there's swamps all over the place because just like Nick, you're here with the Mississippi Delta down there. Right. Like, uh, that's right. It's a lot like Southeast Louisiana. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's, there's water everywhere. Um, actually all of, all of South Louisiana. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes yeah. It's, in, it's in your yard, isn't it? Yeah. Sometimes it's in my house. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Laugh now, but cry then. <laughs> I hope I didn't lose my thing there. Just keep the frogs and gnats out, you know? Yeah. I don't <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Okay. So our first question, this is based on the reading from last Friday, I think. And we may have talked about this last Saturday, but we'll go over it real quick. How do we see God's bigger plan for Israel in Genesis 46, 1 to 7? That's a question. Somebody else answered. How do we see God's bigger plan for Israel in Genesis 46, 1 to 7? Um, that was back when they were, um, Joseph was, Joseph, yeah. yeah, Joseph was getting in charge of, of Egypt and his brothers came over and they, um, they met with him and, um, found out who he was. So I guess God's plan was setting that up in this, in this part in 46, 1 to 7. I got it. I got a question that, and that. Joseph and his brothers, are they essentially, they established the, the so-called 12 tribes of Israel? Is yeah. That, is that where that is established? Yes. Mm -hmm. And and Paul, chime in here. Uh, you, you've got seminary training, Paul, and I don't think anybody else does, but uh, the, there were two, Joseph's two sons. Were tribes. Were also considered tribes. And I think they ended up 12 tribes because Levi uh, ended up dispersed among all the tribes as a priestly. Like, That's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were given. They were given forty-eight cities. You're right. Right. And they were scattered throughout the, the land. Other, right. And and it, we'll eventually get into the lost tribes of Israel at some point, but uh, um, that that plays into a lot of stuff later. Um, all right. Second question here is. What comfort is God's sovereignty in our current situation? So how do we apply what God did for Israel to where we are today? Well, the same promise that he gave uh, there in that scripture. He says, don't be afraid. I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to bring you back. He's going to, he's going to restore them. He's going to. Uh, you know, provide for his people. That's, of course, we see that throughout the New Testament scriptures. Yeah. You still see it today. Yeah. And he, he has a plan for us. I, you know, I, we have three sons that have all gone astray and we, we're believing that they're coming back because God has a plan for them. He has, I, I think he has a, uh, he's touching each one of his heart and they know what their mission is. And we, we have faith, Kim and I have faith that they're going to come back. And I, I think everybody who has prodigals believes that. And we're, we're standing on that. Uh, let's see, the next one. Oh, this is, I was going to show you, this is a picture of an aerial view of kind of part of that now Delta area. You can see there's, there's farmland and, and Joseph was, you know, we've talked about how these, these, patriarchs were kind of conniving and Joseph uh, certainly picked out the best land for his family to thrive in and I, that was part of God's plan that wasn't just Joseph 
that was part of God's plan. I, I think the word was shrewd, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we might, we, might, we might call that wise. Wise, shrewd, right. Yeah, so how did Jacob's death affect Joseph as seen in Joseph, and uh, excuse me, in Genesis 50, 1 to 14? So the, the place they lived in Egypt was Gonash? Goshen. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, so the, the place the, they settled in Egypt was outside of town in Gonash. Is that right? Goshen. 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 Okay. All right, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just... Well, did have any of you ever seen the uh, the the movie that I referenced back last week, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat? Yeah, no. I think the I if, saw, if I saw the musical. Yeah, I sent you some of those clips, and the one that last one where uh, Donny Osmond comes up in the chariot in the clouds, and and Jacob is walking across and falls down, and he goes over and picks him up, and and they reconcile. Uh, I think that's a beautiful moment. And, and it kind of shows, I think it, even though it's just, you know, it's not necessarily scripture, it's really showing the emotion that was involved on both sides. Um, that that uh, Joseph loved his father just as Jacob loved Joseph. And when, uh, when Jacob died, uh, he had the same kind of emotions that any of us would have had. Most of us, I think, most of us, the ones I see on here, except Mike, are old enough that our fathers have probably gone on to be with the Lord, just like Jacob was. Michael, younger, he may not be in that situation. I don't know. But, uh, you know, that's something we all go through. That's part of life, and it affects us all. Um, and, and the next question is, how did he honor his father? even in death. I think, I think later we read, didn't, did, was it Jacob's bones that were carried with during the Exodus? That was jo Joseph's bones. Jacob, uh, Joseph took Jacob Joseph's back bones. while he was, while Joseph was still alive. They had a big procession as they, uh, they took him across. That's what this is right here. They took him across the Sinai assuming they made a straight line uh, back to Hebron and buried him at Machpelah, the same place that Abraham and Isaac was buried and the same place that uh, Jacob's first wife, Leah, was buried. Uh, last week, I think I mentioned that I didn't remember if any of his wives were, but but since then I've, I've studied Machpelah a little bit more and Leah was buried there too. So he went, Joseph took him back to, um, to Hebron that area where Macpella was and had him buried there. And, and I've got a, they stopped along the way. I think it, they called it the threshing floor at Adad or something like that. That was actually was down in this area. That shows them going a straight line. The threshing floor, I think it was down, down in this area. And when we were in Israel, I hope that, yeah, that's the next picture. Uh, this is what a threshing floor looks like. Um, this was one at, uh, there was a national park there where they're growing all the native trees so they can, Israel's real big on trees. And this was the national park where they're uh, cultivating all those trees and transplanting them all over the country. But this is the threshing floor at that national park. Uh, they basically, they throw the wheat or barley or whatever it is in there. And uh, you see that fork right there, that's the winnowing fork. And they drag this thing around in it and break it all up and separate the wheat from the shaft in this threshing floor. Um, but anyway, they had, and, and when Joseph, Joseph took Jacob back to Machpella, uh, they made a huge procession. They treated him like he was Egyptian royalty. Mm -hmm. uh, they treated Jacob that way and had all of uh, Joseph, it said Joseph took all of his servants and all the underlings that he had in the government they had a big procession and the canaanites were they recognized that he had to have been loyalty um so you know that's 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 in the bible all right 
our next thing, we're getting into Exodus now. Uh, at the beginning of Exodus, if you remember, uh, Moses had Moses had killed that Egyptian and fled over here to Midian. Uh, did any of you get a chance to watch that video that I sent last Sunday about the alternate view of where Mount Sinai was and the, the where they crossed across the Red Sea in this area right here. Um, if you watch that, it was pretty convincing that later on, you know, the, the, yes, tradi I saw it. the traditional location of Mount Sinai is right here in the Sinai Peninsula. But um, it looks more realistic that Mount Sinai is probably over here in Midian because um, Moses fled to Midian when he killed that Egyptian and he lived with his, he had, he married, what was her name, Zipporah, I think. And Zipporah. his, his uh, father-in-law, Jethro, was a Midianite. And Moses saw the burning bush while he was tending Jethro's flocks. So he wouldn't have been over here tending Jethro's flocks because Jethro lived over here. And the burning bush was came back later on is the, the mountain of Mount Sinai, the top of the mountain was basically described as being on fire. Uh, so it makes more sense that Mount Sinai would be over in the same area that Midian, that in Midian, Midian that, that Moses originally heard from God. Um, so I, I guess I just answered that first question, what he witnessed in Exodus 1, 14 was that he saw God in that burning bush. Um, how do you think that affected him after he murdered an Egyptian and ran away because they were going to kill him and he'd been over there for 40 years? Uh, and God, God approaches him. Uh, how would you feel if you had run away and given up everything and then God tells you that you're going to go back and take the people out? Somebody? I, uh, I guess I, <laughs> I don't know. I'd be, I wonder if it'd be a blessing or a punishment. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> I think he probably did look like it as look at it as a punishment. He certainly uh, uh, didn't want didn't want the assignment like um, many chosen persons in the book. <laughs> yeah, he tried to argue his way out of it, didn't he? Yeah, and he said, "I'm I'm slow of speech, you know, yeah. and it's like I'm not quick witted and." That's why, you know, he went to Aaron. <laughs> that's, that's a real good point. Um, I, I guess in a way, you know, it was a way for him to redeem. He killed an Egyptian. Uh, it doesn't seem like it was being punished for that, you know, but he was certainly being tasked with, uh, put it this way, you can look at it different ways, but he killed the Egyptian who was harming his people. Right. That, that takes some courage to do that. And he did it in Egypt. Yeah. And then, and then he realized, uh oh, you know, I got to get out of here because <laughs> that was spreading around. So, you know, it, it's both, it, it's an act of courage because of what, why he did it. So, well, certainly, certainly from our perspective, looking at it 3,500 years later, uh, it was part of the plan. And, correct. There were a lot worse things that God's heroes did than killing an Egyptian. Uh, right. If you compare that to some of the other things that David did and things like that, that that's pretty minor. Uh, at least it was a bad guy. Um, but what further along there, what, what do you think it meant when God called himself, I am that I am? I've always, I've always, I'm sorry, I, I've got neighbors that walk by every morning and I wave to them out the window, sorry. <laughs> no, that's what you're doing, okay. Yeah, yeah I've got. I've, I've always wondered about, you know, it, it's it's interesting, you know. Well, I, I think he's kind of saying that he is the author of everything. I'm the alpha and omega and the beginning and the end. And that's kind of, Kind of what I think that means. Um, and is I, that I am is obviously a translation from is it Aramaic or is it Hebrew or is it it's gone through many translations, right? So that one would have been from Hebrew. 
Um, and any, they any were good early Hebrew too. Any, any insight, you know, for our uh, scholars here? Uh, well, the phrase oh, there. Say- and the phrase okay. there is the same what Jesus used when he they asked, uh, you know, he said, before Abraham was, I am. It's the same same words that's being used there, which is kind of interesting to me. Yeah, you know? well, it's, it's Jesus saying, I'm God. Yeah. I think. That yeah. Kind of confirms that. Uh, and that isn't, Paul, isn't that the uh, basis of the Hebrew, um, not not legally saying the name of God. The Yahweh is a sort of our English version of what they won't say. Right. Well, yeah. I, yeah. The way I I'm sorry. Go ahead. So when God says, I am, um, nobody else can say his name because... If you say I am, you're referring to somebody else, not yourself, or you're referring to God. But it's kind of a weird thing with language that you And so it's impossible to say his name because you're not I, you're not him, you're just saying I am. Yeah. Yeah, and it and and it's holy too. I think there's there's reverence in that. Um this uh, this is the alternate view of Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Saudi Arabians don't allow any inspection of it. They're you know they're they're pretty anti-Jewish. They're they're Muslim based. They're not as they're not radical Muslims like Iran, but they're still Muslims and they don't want to recognize the Jews as being the descendants of Abraham. They think they're the descendants of Abraham. So they're, they do their best to hide things like this, but that, that is not a cloud shadow on that mountain. Uh, the, the mountain in the, the, the assumed Mount Sinai that's in Saudi Arabia, the top of the mountain is black and uh, stories of people that have been able to get up there and get some of the rocks is that it's a surface blackness. It's not through the rocks that it scrapes off like it's smoke. And that goes along with the description in, in Exodus that the, the pillar, the, the mountain was covered in smoke when Moses was there. And it, it kind of has that evidence today. Um, this timeline is a little bit not not that informative, so I won't go over it, but our next question, uh, how does the renewal of God's promise to Israel in Exodus 6.13 compare to Genesis 17? Uh, in Genesis, um, God commanded Israel. I, did, I didn't catch, this, this didn't make sense to me when I looked it up, because in Genesis 17, He's talking about circumcision being the confirmation of the covenant. Uh, in Exodus, he's not. I don't see any um, any revelation, any relevance to what it says in Genesis, other than it's kind of it's kind of leaning toward obedience being important. Um, I, I don't know. Anybody, anybody, anybody else looked that up comparison-wise? Because that didn't make sense to me. I, I don't see the comparison there. But it was talking, both of them were talking about obedience to a certain extent. And, yeah, if we take that, going to the next question, how do we see God's faithfulness? Um, the thing that brought came to mind to me was were they obedient to the circumcision part while they were in captivity in Egypt? Uh, I remember, if you remember Moses, when he started, when he when he saw the burning bush and told Jethro he's going back to Egypt to bring the people out, he started going and his wife circumcised his son because he had not done that. So obviously Moses hadn't been obedient. And it makes me wonder whether or not the 
you know, for, from the time of Joseph, the 400 years that they were in captivity, if they were holding up their end of the bargain. And I don't think the scripture addresses that. Do you know anything about that, Paul? Um, I can't pinpoint that, but it seems to me that when they renewed, um, you remember when they went over into the promised land, that one of the first things they did was they had all, all the men circumcised, giving, you know, kind of meaning they haven't been practicing that. Sounds like it, doesn't it? Yeah, that's, that's I, I hadn't gotten that far this time through, so I, that's that's something to look for when we get there. That's coming up in a couple more, a few more chapters, I think. We'll read that this coming week. Um, but it's it hadn't been addressed yet. Um, yeah, that was my thought that Moses wasn't being obedient, so I kind of think the rest of them probably weren't either. And what's Paul saying there is they didn't follow through on that part of the covenant until they got back to the promised land. Um, so, um, and that, oh, that's in that's in Judges. Um, I won't say Judges six, but that's probably not right. While you're looking that up, we we're talking about the Promised Land. This is a picture we took out there out the window of the airplane uh, going in. That's Tel Aviv over there in the in the background. So it's kind of a Promised Land picture, I guess, is why we took that. Why I showed that. Uh, the airports between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, and, and that was going past Tel Aviv on the way into Jerusalem, into the airport. All right. Now we have Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, just you know, I, I thought that'd be kind of neat for this one. Um, yeah, let's see. It says, consider Exodus 10, 1 to 12, and Romans 9, 17 to 18. Why was Pharaoh's heart hardened? <laughs> Answer, please. It says in the scriptures that God hardened his heart. What'd you say? I said, it says in the scriptures that God hardened his heart. Well, that's kind of what we're going to get to here. Um, and why did he do that? To show to show his glory. <laughs> well, it, yeah. he was in charge. <laughs> That's yeah, to fulfill his purpose, I think. Yeah. But do you think that Pharaoh had any active part in that process? Oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, there, there. I think there are a couple places, a couple scriptures through that these passages where it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. So he, you know. Right. It wasn't just that God hardened his heart. Oh, he had uh, 10 chances, didn't he? Yeah. And so he had to know what was going on. And and, and if, if you ever saw that movie, Yul Brenner was pretty arrogant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pretty good. Played it well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how do we see God's justice for Israel and what was going on? showing the people that the Israelites that uh, he was all powerful and what he said he did yeah yeah and <laughs> if you remember um, the last when they were leaving the Ramses area up there where the where Pharaoh was when they, they gathered up and started leaving the day before they they plundered Egypt basically they asked for a whole bunch of gold and all the jewels and all the stuff they took off with and got animals and all kinds of stuff when they left. It wasn't like they left their poor. Uh, I think they they got recompense for the four four hundred years of slavery. I think. Um, yeah, that's that's true, huh? Yeah. Well, they were told to ask for these things, and it was given to them. Yeah, yeah, kind of was. They they asked for it, and they got it. It didn't, you know, plundering is taking by force, too, in my mind. They, oh, they, they if, you, if you think that they'd been give, putting all those plagues on them, <laughs> that kind of was, it's like, all right, we don't want no more plagues. Right. So in, in that sense, maybe it was plundering. I, I may have misused that word, but I think it kind of was. No, no, it's 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 written in the scripture. I mean, it's plunder is, is the word used. Yeah. yeah. The, the Passover initiated 
instigated in Exodus is still celebrated today. And, and you know, we know that we, we sort of base our resurrection celebration on when Passover is because right. those two go together. Um, which kind of leads into that question. What's the importance of remembering what God has done? Because we forget. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, we take things for granted, don't we? Yeah. Well, that's why, you know, in the, during the, it was during the Passover, the Lord's Supper was instituted and Jesus said, do this to remember what I'm going to do. Well, why would he say remember it? Well, unfortunately, I mean, how can you forget his death and resurrection? But sometimes it's, it uh, loses, you know, lo not, I won't say loses its significance, but we need that rem rem reminding. Uh, sure. and, the, and the Passover is a picture of Jesus' right. sacrifice on the cross. Yep. It's like he, he told them for 1,500 years, this is what I'm going to do. And some of them caught it and some of them didn't. Some of them still don't. Yeah. And, um, and that last question, I think we've already answered. What, what, must, be we, what must we be wary of? And you know, we said we, don't, we can't forget that. Yeah. Jim, it's like, uh, you remember we talked about Zola Levitt's um, video on the Passover, right? Christ of the Passover. You know, I don't know if those other, if you got the rest of you have seen that, but that'd be well worth uh, your, your time uh, to watch that video. I think it's, I think it's even on YouTube. You, I'm pretty you sure that. it is. I'm pretty sure it is, and that is really, really good. Uh, Zola died. Uh, he passed on. What was it, Paul? Maybe 2000. 15 or so something like that or 2007 yeah it's, yeah. it's been a little while but right. he was a he was basically a rabbi a uh, messianic messianic rabbi uh looked like you would expect moses to look almost um didn't have he was bald on top but he looked look the, the part of a jewish rabbi and he kind of talked the same way uh he, he just just what you expect a, a jewish rabbi to act and he was a really, really good teacher. Uh, Zola Levin. Yeah. And you want to look him up sometime. He's got a lot of good stuff. His ministry goes on. Um, right. There's people that are still doing it, but, but Zola is, yeah. has gone on. But they still show his videos. When you say messianic rabbi, what, what does that mean? And that he still believes uh, there's a messiah, but being a rabbi that messiah has not been delivered yet no no is no that... a, Messi a messianic jew is one who's accepted christ as the messiah. okay that's what i didn't know so they're they're christians uh they're essentially they're, they're, they're essentially uh, jewish christians right 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 and uh i've sent you some of those videos from joshua aaron that uh, the guy that led our tour group in israel he's a messianic jew okay his, yeah. his mother was actually a holocaust survivor his mother uh, okay yeah she was there there too it, they have a really interesting story that uh her and her brother were separated after the holocaust and she ended up getting adopted by an american and uh his brother or her brother was a uh, stayed in in israel and was a, a you know normal jew i'm not even sure he even spoke english but they had they used to have this and they may still have it but over in israel they had this phil donahue kind of show where they did interviewed people and they had his brother on or had her brother on uh, it's been i think 1999 uh had her brother on and were telling the story about how he'd lost his sister and from the holocaust and had been looking for her all of his life so they were they put out this thing to say uh if anybody knows who she might be to call this number and then they said oh by the way we've got somebody in the audience here to meet with you <laughs> and they had brought her over from the united states they figured out who she was and brought her over and had joshua when he was a teenager was was there with him and it was, it was a real neat thing that probably is on youtube too um cool anyway on to the next thing uh the the exodus there's different 
thoughts of what the path of the Exodus was, but going along with what the, the video that I sent last Sunday, where they, the first place the scripture says they went from Joseph, from Goshen to Succoth. And Succoth is down here in the Sinai Peninsula. And this, this particular website here talks about why they would have gone there because there were Egyptian copper and turquoise mines down in that area. And, and there would have been Jewish slaves down there that they needed to go gather up on their way. Um, so, I mean, I just threw that slide in there just as an aside. It kind of goes along with the, the video I sent. I, I tend to want to go along with that <coughs> choice of the, the path of the Exodus. I'll show later, I think, but some of them show them going down in here to Mount Sinai is down there. Uh, the one alternate's down here in the southern southern tip of the Sinai Peninsula, and then going back up here, and that that story has them crossing the Red Sea right here, which that's where the Suez Canal is now. So it's not quite the same way that it would have been 3,500 years ago, but before it was the Suez Canal, it was a marshy area, similar to what you're, you have down there in southern Louisiana, uh, Nick, but uh, that wouldn't have been a, a real big miracle to cross the Red Sea right here. That's the Suez finger of the Red Sea. This is the, I think, I can't remember the name of it. It started with an A, a different finger of the Red Sea. Uh, but he, he shows them crossing down right here. There's that that uh, point right there. This, this little area he talks about, and I'll show it later, I think, uh, is a, a flat area that's about five miles wide and three miles deep. And it would have been plenty big enough for five or six, or what was it, three million people, however many it were, to have gathered up in that area with the Egyptians on the hillside looking over them before they crossed the Red Sea. This just looks like a better place for, the, for them to have crossed. And it goes along with a lot of other things more, I think, more consistently. You, you know, you, that was something that struck me was I never gave thought to how many were actually in Exodus. And I forget which chapter it is, but they say 600,000 men plus the women and children. Right. So you figure you take that times three or four, but probably even more because they had lots of children back then. Yeah. It's like, Ooh. that's a phenomenal number. Well, I, I remember seeing a long time ago, I saw a video uh, where some, you know, some civil engineer was talking about how much water that would have been required for that many people. And, you know, he said that would have taken what in modern times we'd have had a, a probably a 60 inch water main going to serve that many people. And yeah, I mean, that's that's as many people. I mean, Louisiana has just a little over four million people. I mean, yeah. everyone in Louisiana would be walking through the desert. I mean, like that's just mind boggling to me. Yeah. And, and you remember they, they talked about and, and Moses split that rock. I've got a picture of the one over, over, well, it's, let's see, Mount, Mount Sinai is over here. The, the rock is, uh, there's a rock similar to that that I'll have a picture of in a few minutes that kind of gives you the scope of what that might have been. Um, but anyway, the lesson we learn in Exodus 16, 1 to 8, that's uh, still silver. Yeah. Okay, now I'm down to where I couldn't find my answer here. Uh, okay, what, what is the lesson we learned from Exodus 16, 1 to 8? You remember what that is? Uh, let, me, let me, since we've got a little bit of time, I'll read that real quick. Exodus 16. Help me, Jim. Are you... Did we have these questions through one of your links or something ahead of the Yeah, reading? I sent it I sent it back when before we got started. I, I lost my syllabus, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're supposed to get those once a month and I haven't looked to see if they sent okay. it yet. I think last time it ended up in my junk folder and I need to look and see if it's there. But yeah, I'll send those send those along. Um, all right, 16 1 to 8. The whole Israelite, and I'm reading from the NIV here, the whole Israelite community set out from Elam, and there you see Elam down here, 
uh, and came to the desert of sin. Now that, that sin doesn't mean anything about the same way we think of sin, it's just the name of it, uh, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after they'd come out of Egypt, that's when that happened. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if we only had died in the Lord's hand in Egypt, by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and ate the food we wanted, but you brought us into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for the day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they're to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening, you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning, you will see that the glory, see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are you that you should grumble against us? And Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. So the question is, what is the lesson we learned from Exodus 16, 1 to 8? Well, God will supply all of our needs. That's right. <laughs> and don't complain yeah. about it. <laughs> hey, food. Yeah, yeah. So I I, it, it, it speaks to being a thankful heart, I think. Uh, you know, when and Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, he didn't teach, he didn't tell them to pray that we all be millionaires and get uh, blessings forever. He told, he, he said, pray for our daily bread. And, uh, and I think that's, that's sort of speaking toward being thankful for what we got. We, we have a large food pantry at our church, you know, with the second harvest support. And uh, they feed lots of hungry people. Well, that's that's what the church should do. I think I, I, yeah. it's actually a separate entity. It's it's uh it's got its own you know five hundred one whatever you know tax deductible entity. It's it's a separate entity from the church, but it's but it's held in our fellowship hall with lots of fair fair amount of volunteers that work at it multiple times during the week. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I think Paul's church does something similar, and uh, you know, we attend to Paul's church. We belong to another church, mm -hmm. too, and and we do, uh, at our church family worship center, we do specific um, passing out things yeah. at different times. You know, they gather up uh, food boxes and take them it, out to people. It's just amazing how many people literally, you know, cannot put enough food on the table without that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this this is a map that shows the traditional location of Mount Sinai that down at the southern end of the Sinai Peninsula. Um, I talked to Nick and Michael. You might know some of the cues. I talked to Travis yesterday. Uh, he went to Egypt uh, a few years ago and toured this area. And he went. He said there's a church down in there. I think it's a Catholic church that uh, commemorates that. I haven't been, I, we didn't go over there. We just went to Israel. So I wanted to just get some insight from Travis about what the, what the area was like. And he said, there is a church down there that, that uh, commemorates it, but that's the traditional location of Mount Sinai uh, in the Sinai Peninsula. And this is that uh, the one finger of the Red Sea. And this is another one. I, I checked on Google Earth. You can kind of get a, a feel for what the depth of the water is it'll actually give you some numbers. And this part of the Red Sea is maybe 250 feet deep. Up in here, it's like swampland, like we said. Uh, over here on this, this finger of the Red Sea, there's a place in here that's kind of shallow, you know, in the 250 foot range, but uh, up in this area, it's 2,500 feet deep. Ooh. And back here, it's that deep. That's, that's unbelievably deep for something that small. Uh, yeah. It, that's eight miles across. And I was trying to think of if you walked, if they crossed where it was 2,500 feet deep, uh, how many interstate highways are on that kind of slope? That's a 5% slope grade. 
And and I'm thinking, you know, Paul and Greg and some of you that are familiar with Carrollton, uh, up at the top of the hill is mile marker 38 and the bottom of the hill is 44. So we're talking five or six miles and that's about a 500 foot drop in five or six miles. So uh, crossing a 2,500 foot chasm would be five times as steep as the uh, interstate I-71 is. Wow. Coming down here. Uh, and they, they were, I guess, you know, you can walk pretty steep when you're, when you're walking, you can do it, but it, it would have been steep. All right, consider the Ten Commandments and look at Galatians 3.24. Uh, and so let me look, I had Galatians, I had that up before I started and turned over to uh, Exodus. Let me, let me get to Galatians 3.24. Um, I was set up better before I had to switch computers. Uh, 23, before this faith came, we were, I'll turn around. Uh, before this faith what came, is, pardon? What is it again? Galatians, Galatians 3, 24, or 23 and 24. 3, 24. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Uh, that's kind of the answer right there. Um, the purpose of the law. If we let's think of it in the way this this is a, a real good way to witness to people um, that we're all sinners and we can define that we're sinners by comparison to the law. Uh, and in all of Western society is all the morals of Western society is based on these ten, ten commandments. Um, that that that's the I mean, it's the basis of everything we do. And, and you'll hear people make comments sometimes that don't try to legislate morality, but every law is legislating morality. And every law is, if you look to where it came from, goes back to what Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. Um, so, you know, if, if we think of it that way, uh, we have a conscience that we know what's right and wrong, whether we're Christian or not. That all men generally know what's right and wrong, um, unless you've just totally lost your mind. And that kind of leads to the second question Should we follow the Ten Commandments today, and why or why not? Thoughts? Well, <clears throat> I think personally, you know, the closer you can follow them, you know. A lot, usually the better your life goes. <laughs> that's that's a real good point. That's really good. That's whether, true. whether you're a believer or not, a believer or not, yeah. uh, it it gives you a better status in society. Uh, if you're not a derelict, and, yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and so you're trustworthy. You know, you're yeah. trustworthy. You know, if you don't, you know, coveting your neighbor's belongings, things, materials, and otherwise. I mean, it's just. Uh, you know, I hear I hear women I know at times through my life talk about men they don't trust because just the way they look at them. And so I, I have a lot of female friends, platonic relationships I've had over my life. And I think it's because they they I didn't give them a reason not to distrust me. Yeah, and that, that could be just by the way you look at them and just the way you talk to them. And sure. a lot of a lot. Of, and do not know how to behave in that way for one reason or another. They just I think they're just not able to do that for some reason or another. So if you follow those laws, you know, and it was it was taught to me, you know, as a as a kid growing up in a Catholic church, you know, it was it was that was preached, you know. Oh, that's, I, mean, I, I think it's the it's the foundation of society of a civilized yeah <laughs> a civilized. yeah yeah 
Well, uh, I wanted to get a few things. That's all of our questions, but um, this is kind of a, one of the alternate paths. It doesn't show them going down here to Succoth, and they and the Bible says they went down there. I suck. Oh, well, that shows Succoth is right there. I'm sorry. Uh, so they did. That's not down in that area, but this shows where they would have crossed, according similar, consistent with that video that I showed that I uh, linked to you last week. And then going over here to Mount Sinai instead of the traditional location of Mount Sinai being here, the one over in Saudi Arabia is right here. One of the things he talked about in that video, uh, and I think I may have mentioned it earlier, is the Saudis kind of not supporting any archaeological research there. And they're really hesitant to let anybody go in. There was on this side, on the Egyptian side, there's a pillar that Solomon erected. Of course, that was, uh, what, eight, six, seven hundred years later after, after the crossing. But Solomon erected a pillar right here in that area and another pillar on this side to commemorate the Red Sea crossing at these two areas. And that pillar is still there. Um, it had fallen over, but it was, a, it was reset uh, sometime in the century. There was one up until in the 80s, the one on this side was still there and the Saudis took it away. Uh, there's a marker there now where it used to be, but the Saudis took that pillar away and we don't know what they might've done with it. Um, this is the rock I was telling you about, the split rock. Uh, that's, that's not Mount Sinai, I don't think in the background, but it's in that general area, the rock that Moses struck uh, and water came out, and that looks, I mean, that, the scale loses perspective there. Uh, a man is about the size of that rock right there. I've seen, I saw a picture from a different angle of somebody standing next to that rock right there, and it was about as tall as it was. Uh, this thing is maybe 50, 60 feet tall, and there is, it, it's not a, a, a sharp cleavage through here like it would be if say an earthquake caused it or something like that. It is worn and eroded and there's actually an erosion path down the other side because you can see over here, there's a dry lake bed on the other side over there. And you can kind of see that right there that uh, uh, this looks more like what you would expect than anything you see over on the Sinai Peninsula. And it makes more sense that this would have been the rock that the water came out of, and there would have been enough water in, in the lake that it made to supply the six or three million people or however many it was. Uh, this is just a picture when we went to Israel. This is, this is totally beyond anything we've studied, but I wanted to show you go to Israel and they feed you real well. Our first, this was our first night. This wasn't part of our tour. And we stayed at what was kind of like a bed and breakfast place. And this was our breakfast. We had to order it off a menu. So it wasn't like the whole group was there getting a breakfast. Together. But uh, that was my breakfast and there was Kim's breakfast. She'd already eaten most of it, but they feed you real well. Um, but that's, that's all I have today. What's anybody else want to say? Hey, Jim, I just got a question. So that picture of that rock, is that, um, you say that's what they, that's the rock they believe Moses struck? That's one side. Uh, yeah, I think I may have told you that there's alternate um, right. traditions, I guess is the best word, right. alternate traditions for a lot of things. But this tradition goes along with the Red Sea crossing being down there at, the, at that, that eastern finger of the, of the Red Sea uh, and for Mount Sinai being in, Aus, in uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, it's close to where that that mountain with the burnt top is. Uh, it's in the same general area. And again, the Saudis don't allow much. I mean, if they know you're there, they run you off. So, uh, so, so is there is there much archaeological evidence to try to, you know, I, I guess, to try to actually uh, substantiate which which way the uh, you know. The, the Israelites traveled. Is that what part of that is? Part of that effort? I I, I kind of think so. If you watch that video from last Sunday that I sent, uh, he shows some underwater pictures of 
chariot wheels that are in that area where that crossing was that he shows that are wow. you know, covered with uh, with a lot, you know, coral build up and everything. Um, been there for a long, long time. That was the cross. That was the crossing at the 250 foot depth of the Red Sea. Uh, it was close to the Saudi. Um, it was over in, on this side. He said That's right. they okay. didn't get down into. No, I, that wasn't down at 2,500 feet. Uh, he he described it being close to this area <laughs> over here, where they were going up to the uh, Saudi side. So so where's the border of the Saudi? Is that Saudi on one side and what's on the other side? Is it Egypt? Uh, well, let me see if I can get a bigger picture to talk about that. Uh, at that time, at the time of Moses, the Sinai Peninsula was, Egypt, was Egypt. And okay. this is the border for Israel. And that's, that's still the border, more or less, um, and has been for... I guess since Israel took back the promised land. Well, no, no, no. If you remember last week, I showed you there were three different, and I don't have that slide in this set, but uh, there were three different uh, boundaries that I showed. One at the time, one that was the promised land to Abraham, mm -hmm. one that was the time of Jesus, and one that is where he is right now. And this border coincides with Abraham's promised land and the modern border is is right here I mean, it is part of that route too to try to stay stay away from where the philistines were because yes. that was yeah that's not a avoid war right, right. Uh, let me see if i can i don't remember i don't have any they, they did defeat the what is it amalekites was it that amalekites yeah i think that's who it was yeah, yeah. um as long, as long as moses held his hand <laughs> right <laughs> But you needed help with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, this is this is a better one. Uh, Egypt's over here. This is the Sinai Peninsula, and the Sinai Peninsula is all desert. It's all wilderness. There's nothing there that's, um, you know, like the Nile Delta over here is green. If you get over into Israel, past this, the Gaza, Gaza Strip is up upright in here, and the Negev Desert is a desert. Uh, this was kind of where the, I think the Edomites, uh, Esau's descendants were in this area. And over here is Saudi Arabia. This is Jordan. I think the border goes, that might be it right there, the border between Jordan and Saudi Arabia. Um, I don't think, I don't have a better picture of that. Uh, last week I did. but I Making know. me hungry, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, they feed you well over there. We certainly didn't lose weight. Um, but going back to that water and then the rock that was struck, I'm thinking that the water was already under under the ground or around the rock. Well, if we look at it from a, from a physical standpoint, that would have to be the case. But you got to consider that uh, I, if one of the things I said in our first meeting that what uh, the way I look at scripture is that uh, it's it's a communication between a supernatural universe and a natural universe and our understanding of what we see physically and the understanding from the supernatural universe that God operates in uh, is very limited. So that's where things get miraculous when those two things intersect. And much of what is given to us in scripture is that intersection between the supernatural and the natural. And um, when we call miracles. And if we look at it as a miracle, it wouldn't have mattered where the water came from. God knew his people needed water and he put it there. So, I mean, if you, if you want to be a... Uh, a geologist or a civil engineer like me and Nick and Michael are, then we're going to look for explanations. But you also got to understand that we're talking about supernatural things. So we yeah. may, may not find those answers. It's just like, isn't is it manna? I think I've heard in one Bible class, isn't manna a, a type of a flower? 
I didn't know that. <laughs> I neither. I thought I'm not, I'm not sure. Check me on that, but uh, I, I think it can be. It exists today. I, I, I've well, they it. they it describes that it tasted like. Is it coriander? It's like a wafer with honey or something. Or, yeah, yeah. Or in coriander or coleander seed, whatever that yeah. is. Something right. I didn't recognize. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe that, no, you know, that, that, again, that again may be trying to describe something supernatural in natural terms. Yeah, well, all I know is supernatural, but, but the manifestation is, you know, is in the natural world, you know, right, rock right. and water in the natural world. Yeah, yeah. And you know. we put it this way: we we find oil, oil is mined because it's trapped in rock. <laughs> so water could be trapped in rock too, you know. Yeah. That's Actually, water's trapped in rock too, deep down below the the ground. Well, if if you read uh, closely what it says about the flood before at Noah's time. Uh, not only did it start raining, but the great springs of the uh, uh, underground broke forth too at the same time. So, right. I mean, that's following exactly what you're saying. And I don't know if you remember, I may have mentioned in one of these meetings back when we were talking about that, that uh, the terrain of the earth may have changed while that flood was going on. There may not have been real tall mountains before that. And the water breaking forth from the deep would go along with mountains and tectonic plate activity moving things around. So that, that kind of all goes together. If, if and again, you just, that perspective. it says all over the world, but you just have to flood where the people were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if they weren't all over the world yet, so. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they did consider the Middle East to be and then I think uh, anthropology says the same thing, that that's where most people were. Right. Yeah, kind of. Civilization of came from that area. At a place of origin, yeah. 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 That seems to be what science is supporting, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that uh, I referenced the, that, I forgot what they call it, but the, the matriarchal gene in the DNA. Right. They call it the, the Mother Eve or whatever it is. That they trace it to right, right in the same area up in the, up, up north of here a little bit, of what we anticipate the garden. So you're saying is. you're saying uh, at least that that is saying it's not out of Africa. No, it's out of this this area just up here where yeah, I think the oldest fossil right isn't Lucy the oldest fossil they, that's out of Africa or something. Yeah, but that's that's not where the DNA points so. Gotcha. Yeah, it's an amazing story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it just it just puzzles me that you know I guess you got you got the Christian side of the New Testament and you got the the, the Jewish side that still waiting. Yeah. Right. You know, to well, me to me that's where they're joined together at the second coming. If that's what you right. Want. That's it's when exactly, they, well. That's that's when they, that gets consolidated. You know? Yeah. <laughs> that's a good way to look at it. That's a good way to look at it. I mean, that's that's what I I I personally believe, and that's what I hope for. You know. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Interesting. Read. Unfortunately, I had to cover about twenty chapters this morning before the Zoom class. That's why I, I asked you. Do I have to get today's reading too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, haven't, I haven't done today's yet. I, I fell behind. It was a busy. I haven't week. done today's either. I just fell behind. Uh, yeah, I'm in Exodus chapter 20 is where I'm in that. I got to 22. <laughs> I I skipped I skipped through uh, a brief skim through the laws, you know. Uh, yeah, and, and that's really interesting too, you know. And, and I, you know, when you read all the laws, you know, don't do this, do that. A lot of if you do this, you get put to death. You know, is that you know, again? What's the purpose of all that? Is so, so they. So they maintain, so they grow in numbers, so they, you know, so the, they don't battle each other, you know, which, man, you got three, four, five million people walking across a hot desert. <laughs> Tempers would flare, wouldn't they? Let me tell you, it doesn't, you know, right. You know, you go with 20 people uh, on a trip or a hike somewhere for a day, you're going to have some uh, <laughs> head bumping. So I can't imagine what that was like. <laughs> well, they ended up, the earth swallowed up a bunch of them, I think. Yeah, you know, they didn't all make it, right? There was a reason it took 40 years. You know, you had to. 
right. Uh, the wheat from the chaff, right? <laughs> I, I want to, since we're, we're finishing up here, I want to run through some quick uh, introductions. I'm looking at who's on here. Michael, uh, Michael lives in near Tampa. He's originally from Mississippi. He's in the process of maybe, are you not going to Georgia right now, are you, Michael? You were in Georgia, weren't you? Right, yeah, I'm heading back to Florida now. Heading back to Florida? Yeah, he's yep. got two pieces of property there. Uh, Michael works with Nick and I. Uh, he's a contract engineer. He used to work for us, uh, but decided to go out on his own, which makes more money, I think, and less time. Uh, gets a contractor's salary, or not salary, but rate instead of working for somebody. Kevin Eskren is Kim's brother. We've talked about that before. Paul Sims, he says he's P2, is P2 means pastor to, I guess. I don't know. No. Maybe it means Paul. He's the pastor. Preacher of Paul. The, pardon? Either Preacher one? Paul. Oh, okay. Preacher Paul. Preacher Paul. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. P2. Okay. He, uh, he's the pastor of the, one of the churches here in town. Greg is, uh, lives in LaGrange, Kentucky. Let's see. What's he say his name is? He says Lannis. Greg says he's Lannis. Lannis is his wife. That's why I think I say I'm Kimberly. Uh, Greg is Greg and I have been friends. I said last week 152 years, but I think I'm going to correct that. It's only been like 96 years. Uh, yeah. Long time. Yeah. Nick, uh, Nick and I are co workers, uh, been working together for six years, and he lives in New Orleans. And I don't, let me see. Ricky down there used to live in Carrollton, now lives in Georgetown, uh, Kentucky. Uh, did I miss anybody that's on there? I'm going through what I think I see. I think that's everybody. Um, did you get is it? Oh, no, never mind. Lannis is uh, the wife's name, Lannis, yeah, yeah, right. That's my baby doll. Oh. There you go. Um, and I'm not Kimberly, <laughs> but Kimberly has the uh, purchased version of Zoom. So we didn't get cut off for 40 minutes. So we've been over a little over an hour. Um, anybody want to, somebody want to close this in prayer if we're going to finish up? Somebody besides me since I started. Greg. Yes, sir. You pray, okay? I can do that. I do it, Lord. We ask you grace and your mercy. And thank you, Lord, for it. Just empower the men here that are watching this. And you get to praise in the glory forever and ever. Amen. To God. Amen. 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 All right. All right. Well, guys, let's have a good day. I'm supposed to be, I, I'm supposed to have a crew out there cleaning off my riverbank. I don't know if they're out there or not. I told them to start without me. Uh, and we're going to take all the brush and all the trees and go out and hopefully lay it down the riverbank. And the river's supposed to come up this week. And I hope it carries it away. So that I'll have a clean riverbank now. Boy, it's all going to end up down here by me, Jim. That's right. You, you, get, you get my oh, New Orleans. <laughs> it's going to go your way. Yeah, the river's supposed yeah. to it's supposed yeah. to rain. I think two inches on uh, tomorrow and Monday, and that'll bring the river up. So I, yeah, they were going to sure. come out next week and do it. And I sent him a text yesterday. and said, "Guys, the river's going to come up next week, and it may not go back down until spring." So, yeah, well, we know it does that. And then, yeah, and then we sit here praying we don't flood every yeah. April and May. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I told him when, when I had him first look at it, I said, if you, wait till spring, it. if you wait till spring, you're going to be dealing with snakes. <laughs> <laughs> right now, the yeah. snakes are asleep. <laughs> yeah. So, Nick, you're in New Orleans? I, I'm actually 25 miles uh, west of, of, of downtown New Orleans. I, I live in a, a little... Uh, unincorporated area called Destrahan. It's in St. Charles Parish, but I'm I'm less than a mile from the Mississippi River. And wow. so my, my area is protected by levees. I uh, but but our flooding our flooding occurs from rainfalls. We we get we get rain we get rain where we get anywhere from up to seven, eight inches sometimes in a two to three hour period. Yeah. And wow. The first time my home flooded was in May '95. There were it was 20 inches of rain in five to six hours. Mm. It was a training effect they call it. But it's crazy. We get crazy rain. We 
on average, Louisiana as a state gets between 58 and 64 inches of rain a year, which which is kind of, I think they get more in the Seattle area, but in Seattle, they get this, it's like a constant miss, I understand, for like, I don't know, eight months out the year, you know, we get these uh, tow chokers. <laughs> it, it just, you know, it rains like the Dickens and uh, it's, there's been local floods, uh, you know, in December, uh, May, uh, May mostly has been the most frequent month, but it can it can happen any time during the year. Part of the problem is where I live, my my immediate neighborhood is entrapped by the levees on the river, which is the high end, and it slopes down from the river going, let's say, north. And then there's a railroad embankment. It, it acts it acts as a dike, and there's culverts that funnel the water through it, but they're not big enough. The you only have to design for a 10 year storm. Well, heck, that, that's an extremely low number that developed you know, ages ago and put forth in law. We get rains that are 50 and 100 year to, you know, plus 100 year type events. And so wow. it's a concentrated rain that you get in a short period. And while we're relatively flat, uh, you still collect a lot of that water. And so there's a huge capital improvement program underway to add more culvert pipe through the tracks to to widen the canals that convey the water to pump stations. We have to pump our water out. We have to pump it out above the flood protected areas uh, out of that into the local wetlands and swamps that convey it eventually into north of us Lake Pontchartrain. So our water and throughout New Orleans, all the rainfall has to be conveyed in canals and underground tunnels and pumped out. That New Orleans has the largest pumps in the world. They, there are pumps that move a million gallons of water a minute when they're operating at full wow. capacity. It's the, the impellers are like twelve and thirteen foot diameter pumps. Because you guys yeah. don't, you guys don't have any hills down there. To let the water drain away. No, our hills are levees. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, we we don't. The the land is very low. I mean, you come off the Gulf Coast and come inland, you have to go, like in the Lake Charles area, which is southwest Louisiana, they were predicting a 20-foot storm surge by hurricane, in the Hurricane Laura. Well, you don't hit a ground elevation of 20 feet until you go 30 miles inland to where the interstate is, Interstate 10, which runs you know parallel to the Gulf Coast. Now, that water isn't going to push that far inland. It can get that high, but if, if, if you study storms, it's like a dome of water that the, that the surge creates. Um, but go to Mississippi, you hit, you hit elevation, you know, you go from zero to 20 foot elevation and within, within uh, I don't know, a few hundred feet, maybe a mile, call it a half mile. I was going to say a mile. Yeah. yeah. You, you don't have that in Louisiana. You don't, you don't get to that 20 foot elevation until you're, you know, 30 miles or more inland. We wow. have that low, lowest formation that on the east side of the river. So What's that? Uh, uh, the lowest soil formation on the east side of the river creates that elevation change there. On on your side of the river, right? Right. Yeah, the volcanic volcanic ash that blew from the west and settled on the east side of the Mississippi River. Yeah, the the lust the lust soils lowest yeah lust, yeah. yeah that yep. was airborne soils deposited along the east side of the river and they kind of start around the Baton Rouge area and they go northward I don't know if they go as high as Minnesota but uh, there's a there's a there's a type of soil that was deposited by wind and uh, it's an interesting soil if you ever read about it if, if you get the book from ASCE Press called the Day the House Fell by Professor Richard Handy from Iowa State. It's a fun read. It's very educational, all about different kinds of soils. And, and it talks about it uh, in the U.S. primarily, but kind of worldwide. It's very educational. Uh, yeah. All the engineers that come into the work Jim and I do, I always tell them, if you want to add to your library and your knowledge, buy this book. It's about 25 bucks from ASTE Press, and it's very educational on the geotechnical you know, aspect of soils. Uh, you're, you, you're not engineers. This is the kind of stuff we talk about all the time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
everything starts with a good foundation, whether it's uh, moral, religious, or or physical. Yeah, a rock, the rock, a rock. We have yeah. no rock in Louisiana. It's all <laughs> you know, a thousand feet under under the underground. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I need, wow. to see if, I need to see how my Mexicans are doing out there. I don't know if they're here or not. Uh, I, sure I need to go fix some of that food that Jim was eating over in Israel, man. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, good to meet you guys. I'm going I'm to head out. Yeah, I'm going to. Good gonna, seeing you all this morning. Have a blessed day. Great yeah. Have a great day. Stay safe. Yeah, right. y'all too. See, see you guys. guys. Wear your mask. Right. Adios. Wear your Bye. mask. See all right. Later. All right. Bye. Bye. Jim.